evenly distributing them. Okay. All right. Now, if you are nominated as an executor, do you have to accept? And what you should you think about before accepting? And bear in mind, we probably have about 10 minutes left. So. Sure. <laughs> I, well, Mike, your question is very important because the answer, quite simply, is no, you do not have to accept. Mm -hmm. And before you do accept, you ought to think about it very carefully because I have often described for clients, when you take on a role as important as an executor or as a trustee or any fiduciary, you're opening yourself up to potential liability, which means that you've got to follow the rules. And if you follow the rules, you're going to be fine. But if you deviate from those rules, you're, you have potential exposure, and that's personal liability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tell clients, look at your personal circumstances. Do you have the physical stamina and strength and mental awareness? Do you have the time? I, you know, for a lot of us, we just don't have the time to be bothered. You feel it's an honor to do it? Well, it's a job. And yeah. it's it's a, almost a full-time job for a period of time. So before you say yes, uh, explore all the possibilities with your counsel. Okay. What are letters testamentary and letters of administration? These are, I'll call them magic papers. That's what I tell my clients. These are the court documents that say you're it. You have now been appointed as the personal representative, either an executor or a special administrator. And it's this piece of paper which got a court stamp on it, oftentimes certified, that you take to the bank and show the bank, and it's your authority to collect the assets of the decedent. So you can collect bank accounts, you can um, submit them and collect life insurance if the estate has been made a beneficiary of life insurance. Um, it's your authority to act and acquire control of everything that the decedent had. Including signing tax returns and things like exactly that. Exactly right. Yeah. You're going to sign tax returns for the estate, um, both the decedent's final personal tax returns as well as fiduciary returns. Okay. What is the significance of a death certificate? Well, it's the evidence of death of the person. Um, you know, you can, you can call somebody and say, well, so-and-so died and, you know, I want to collect the joint tenancy account or I want to uh, do something, they're not going to act until they see a certified copy of the death certificate. There are, you know, I've had a few rare cases where because the body has not been found, the coroner is not going to issue a death certificate in which you, there is a procedure for establishing death mm -hmm. in, in California, uh, but that's the rare circumstance. But primarily, we need that in order with the letters testamentary for collecting assets. Right. So, for example, if you had a mutual fund uh, or something like that, then it, these are documents you would send to the mutual fund company and then they would change the title to the executor's name or Well, well typically we would send a letter of instructions. Mm -hmm. The decedent died, uh, here's either the letters of administration or letters testamentary, here's a death certificate, here's an affidavit of domicile. With all these documents, please change title over to the executor's name. Okay. What notice requirements apply for probate estates? Um, another good question. When we actually formally open a probate with the court, you know, it's all based upon notice. Where probate is trying to prove the will of the decedent. And California law wants interested parties, heirs and beneficiaries, to know that there's a proceeding pending and someone is seeking appointment. So notice of that hearing has to be mailed out to all heirs, all beneficiaries under the will, all nominated executors. Um, basically, if you're named in the will, you're entitled to get notice that a proceeding is pending, that a hearing will be held. Okay. And what about creditors? Uh, creditors also get notice, but they don't necessarily get the notice of hearing of the initial proceeding. The notice to creditors goes out at the time when we have known or reasonably ascertainable creditors. We will send them a notice that says you have a certain amount of time to file a claim with the executor um, for us to consider. And is there a notice that's required to be published in a newspaper or anything that's like that? That's typically done at the same time that the uh, initial proceeding uh, for probate is done. So we'll file a petition. There's a general notice to creditors that's published. Uh, by the way, all these local newspapers, the way they're subsidizing their existence nowadays is by increasing the fees on this notice of death and notice of a petition to administer. Um, even in a small newspaper, 
such as um, San Jose, the cost of publication is in excess of $700 now. So it's getting very expensive just to comply with probate. Okay. What other notices do you need to be concerned about? Well, California law also requires executors to give notice to the Department of Health Services for such things as Medi-Cal claims. We have to give notice um, to the Victims' Compensation Board if any beneficiary of an estate has been incarcerated or might be subject to any sort of claim or lien against his inheritance. Um, those are the other typical notices that we have to provide. Another big one, routinely. I think, is uh, Social Security, right? Uh, and, well, and, probate, and retirement. Yeah. yeah, but that's not a probate requirement, Mike. Yeah. Okay. You would give notice up, upon death to Social Security. Yeah, I'm just thinking in general for things that happen after death, so sure. that's fine. All right. Now, for my personal accounting, I usually just write total deposits down on my checkbook. Uh, or I might not even keep a checkbook at all. I've met an awful lot of people who don't seem to keep checkbooks. Is that okay for an estate? Uh, what records and documents need to be kept? Well, going back to your question, should I be an executor? The <laughs> answer to that is be cautious before you are because you are charged with the responsibility of doing what is called an accounting. Mm -hmm. And you have to account for every penny that you take control of, every penny that you're entitled to take control of, every penny that you spend. Uh, so this type of accounting is a fiduciary accounting. It is basically a reconciliation of what did you do with this estate, what did you spend it on, what did you collect, and what's left over to be distributed. Now accountings can be waived, uh, and frequently they are waived because if the family members who are inheriting trust the uh, executor or the personal representative, they may not want them to go through the uh, task of doing a formal accounting. Um, but in most cases, I tell my client, be prepared to do an accounting. And in fact, we oftentimes will ask the client to provide us with duplicate statements so that we can keep the accounting current. So when it comes time to close the estate, we're ready to close. So I guess I'll add to that that as far as I'm concerned, you need to keep very detailed records for this stuff for the tax return preparation <laughs> process. Sure. So when we're produ preparing fiduciary income tax returns, we want to know all the details about uh, you know the deposits, you know where did that money come from, and is in fact is it income or is it just a transfer from sure. another bank account, what have you? And that's that's from the tax perspective. Yeah. From the court's perspective, they're mostly concerned with what did you spend it on and what was the purpose. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that it was an appropriate purpose. Okay, Bob. Uh, so as we know what will happen with a big topic like this. We're getting down to the end. Uh, we only have about maybe 45 seconds left or so. Maybe you have a, some final words of wisdom for people when they're dealing with this uh, situation of being an executor. Well, kind of just stepping back and looking at the big picture. Certainly planning an estate is important. And all of us think that we're immortal to a certain extent. And none of us are immortal. Um, the most important time to plan, in my opinion, is when you're young with children. And once you have those minor children, it's an appropriate time to plan and have some life insurance. In a post-death context, certainly making it easier on your family, your spouse, your children, your siblings is critical. So take the time and plan your estate. It's not terribly expensive to plan and it can save a lot of heartache and a lot of misery in a post-death context. Okay, folks, with those final words of wisdom, Bob, thank, thank you, you again for being with Pleasure. me. Folks, uh, hope you found this valuable. Be sure that you see an attorney when you're dealing with these situations. And we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.